Uh, the talk I want to give today is uh, actually a different title to what you introduced is on compatibility API evolution, but it's really binary versus source compatibility. And those are some issues I came across uh, for the first time maybe three, four years, years ago while doing those GI development. So I've got weird errors, I discarded them, and at some stage last year I just started now, I sit down and catalog the stuff and write it down so that I, at least I can explain it to my students. And it grew from there and became much bigger, and that's what the talk is. It's all about, and some of you might already have seen some of this stuff because it was a developer survey, and some of you have almost certainly participated in this. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, background. Uh, when, when you write modern applications, as you all know, those slides are slightly academic and slightly teacher-wise because it's what I do for a living here, so I apologize for this. So, we write applications and we don't do this monolithical study. So, as we try to develop modules and we don't develop everything from scratch, we use libraries or, or frameworks. And then this stuff changes all the time. So the real question I'm interested in is when is this change safe? So when we upgrade a library, when is it safe? And that surprisingly depends on two things. At first depends on the change we make, whether it's compatible. And that's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, that's easy to understand, but it also depends how we build and deploy our applications. It's actually two ways to do this for Java. I restrict myself to Java, even though I do believe that most of those issues can also be observed on other platforms. And I actually have a student who is doing the same kind of thing I'm talking about now on C-sharp and .NET, and there are similar issues. So, uh, first of all, we build, compile, and test programs with all libraries and deploy them all together, and a lot of innovation went into this in the last years. So, you know, we have, uh, we started with End and then Maven and Cradle and all of those wonderful tools that really facilitates us, Cradle and Jenkins and Hudson and so on and so forth. And, yeah, and you all know this and you probably all do this, but then there's a different way of doing things, and that is when you only build and upgrade the libraries, and you don't really do this big integration builds where you do integration testing and so on and so forth. And that's of course used by something like OSGI, and I believe also by WebStart, which is the technology behind uh, this standard, JNLP, and maybe some applications of us do this using their own technologies if they are not OSGI based. And there are really business needs that drive this. In particular, big banks operating in all time zones and don't, cannot really hot deploy, and have to hot deploy stuff, cannot just shut down and restart the entire application. That's a, that's a one use case, the big banks in all time zones. The second use case is actually my teenage daughter. She doesn't even understand the concept of switching off your cell phone. The so thing is on all the time, and just restarting the thing seems to be something of my generation of old people, you know? <laughs> Need to try switching it off and on again. <laughs> so that really sets the scene. So uh, on compatibility, so it's again a slightly theoretical slide. It's the only one that is like this. Uh, what is compatibility actually? Well, a good way to think about this is uh, we have our program here. That's why it's a P, and that's a consumer of something. So you consume a service. The service might be a Java class you want. So if you are used to UML style of modeling, you use this kind of lollipop diagram. And then we have a provider, and that's a library. Let's just think about this as a library for the moment. It provides something. So we want a JDBC connection, and here we provide a JDBC connection. You know, that is how this works. And now we can ask, is this compatible with this? So I call it horizontal compatibility, because I just happen to draw it like this. But that's also how other people use terminology, and I just stick to this. Um, okay, so what does it really mean? Well, for now, let's just really focus on we want an interface and that provides a class that matches this interface. But there are already two ways of establishing this compatibility. So one is you compile this program with this in the class pass. The second one is you run this program with this in the class pass. And surprisingly, that is different, as we will see later on. There are other things we are kind of excluding here. Part of the compatibility is semantic compatibility. Does it behave the same way? Or does it behave as expected? Or uh, stuff like quality of service. You know, I want this to provide a certain service to establish a connection within five seconds. Does it do this? So you can talk about all of those things. I ignore all this. We're just really talking about the type, type compatibility. So then you can change this library to a new version. And I call this vertical compatibility. And what this is really is just a rule that says, if that was compatible and we change this by this, we can replace it and this is still compatible. That's what I call vertical compatibility. And that's this kind of notion of backward compatibility uh, everybody is using. And now again, you can talk about two different things. What happens if I recompile this? What happens if I just run this compiled with this? So it's binary versus source compatibility. But you can also start talking about behavioral compatibility. Does it still do the same thing? 
Yeah? And that is a really, really complicated notion to get this right. For now, my programs I'm going to show you are so simple, I will try to catch them over kind of under three lines of code. <laughs> then you can just define behavioral compatibility, does the same thing happen on the console? And that's an easy discussion and that circumvents all, all uh, conclusion discussions. So now I switch to a set of little problems that illustrate this point. And that stuff is also online, and if you have done the survey, you probably already know about this. Skips this. So we have the notion of source and binary compatibility, and you can come up with a very practical definition of this by just saying uh, we have source compatibility if our program compiles with this library in the class pass, and we have binary compatibility if we can run it with this library in the class pass. And those notions are more precisely defi defined in the Java language specification, in particular the notion of binary compatibility. That is only defined with respect to linking. That is, if that happens and you don't get any linkage error, which the JVM detects when it clues them together, then you say it's binary compatible. So you can look it up. There's a very formal definition of this. Right. Which is here, but we can skip this now. So what it essentially means is, when you start your Java program, the JVM looks at it and says, from my point of view, that is good, go ahead, execute it. You know, if it goes past this, then it's binary compatible. That's really what it means, by means of static analysis. So now I came up with little evolution problems. And first I did it for my students, and then I figured out that's probably interesting by answers, where I just came up with a little program and a little library, which I just call lib10.jar, and then I changed it to lib20.jar. Uh, and then I can ask, does the program link with the, with the version 2 of the library if it was compiled with version 1? So what happens if you compile it? and then execute it with another version of the library. What happens if you recompile it with a second version of the library and then execute it? Does the behavior change? And those are really the kind of question I want to discuss. And I just show you little examples and then we can do it as a quiz if you want to. All this stuff is available in the open source repository. I'm not quite sure if it's of interest to write it down, but you can also send an email to con with this data so you can have a look. There's an end script and with this end script you can kind of uh, run through the compiler and then through the linker to see what happens uh, if you really execute this to verify what I'm, what I'm just telling you. So that is the first example. The first two are really just warm up. Have a look at this. We have an, an interface here that has a method and now we just add a second method to it. So here we have foo, here we have foo and bar and here we have a class main that implements this interface. Uh, so we have to implement this method foo. We do so. Now we say new main foo. What happens? Can we compile it with this version of the library? Almost certainly. We can execute this almost certainly. So there's really nothing in here. But really, what happens if you send up place this by this, but don't recompile it? What do you think? Any opinions? It will work. It will work. Yeah? It's binary compatible. That's what it means. It's kind of vertical compatibility. But what happens if you recompile it now? Does this work as well? It will fail. It will fail. So the first observation is binary is not the same as source compatibility. Yeah, and that's, that's an important insight. That itself is actually a surprise, you would say, because you would expect that they are kept uh, 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 consistent. So here we have the opposite example. We have two methods here in the interface, and we remove this. We have here implementations of those two methods, and we instantiate the class, not the interface. So we don't really have a temporary variable of the type interface. That's really important for this example. And then call foo and bar. So you remove bar from the interface, and we execute this, compiled with this, against this library. What happens now? Is it still binary compatible? Do you have an override annotation? We have override annotations, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, it's not source compatible because of the override annotations? Yeah, you're right. Uh, so compilation fails, recompilation fails, because the override annotation really says, I'm overriding a bar and there's no bar there. But it's really just the annotations that does this. Mm -hmm. What about binary compatibility? I think it will work. Yeah, it's binary compatible. Yeah? yeah, it's the same as before, it's binary but not source compatible. Yeah? So it takes this a little bit as a warm up so that you see that those two things are not quite the same. The next example is a little more interesting, and that's actually the first example I came across that gave me some grief. Uh, a couple of months ago when I started investigating this. 
So we have a method here, uh, get call, that returns a collection. So it returns an array. Now we change the return type to a list. List is a also an interface, but it's a subtype of collection. So and here we say collection foo get collection instantiated as collection, so declares a variable as collection, and then just print it out. So is it source compatible? Let's start with this. Can we compile this against this? Yeah. 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 yeah? It's perfectly fine. Well, what is the expectation behind this? The expectation is really that we are, well, it's maybe a little bit theoretical, we are, we are, we are strengthening post conditions. You know, we guarantee more. That's really the idea. We can guarantee more, and that's compatible. Is it binary compatible? No, so the method signature change and you find the method? It's Probably. not the method signature, it's a descriptor. Yeah, yeah. In bytecodes, there's a representation which is which the compiler generates in here, and it's obvious that you've worked with bytecode. Yeah. And that is a reference to this method that says, okay, I have a method that returns a collection, it has this name, it has no parameters, and that <coughs> actually changes. So Lingo uses a descriptor and the descriptor changes, so that suddenly causes an error. If you do this with a library, it breaks your code with a linkage error. With a so-called, or to be more precise, with a no such method error. Not a no such method exception, that's what you get in the reflection API. It's a no such method error. But you can easily fix it. You just recompile it. And everything is fine. So in a way, what we have already seen is there's a, there's a mismatch. And you can find examples for the mismatch both ways. That needs a source, binary compatibility, nor vice versa. So, similar example, and, and by now you kind of can guess where that goes, yeah? What we had with objects before we do now do with primitives. So we return the long, and now we narrow the return type to an integer. Again, it's no source problem really, but it becomes a problem of binary compatibility, because the descriptor of this method changes again. Yeah, that's really just the kind of primitive counterpart of what we have seen before. So, uh, there's a third one. What you do here is uh, we have again a get collection method that returns a collection, and now we specialize the return type to a list. So we ins uh, have a variable of the interface type here, and then we call the method, and then we print it out, and we provide this implementation by creating a new hash set. So, what do you think about source compatibility? I think binary compatibility is clear now that this is broken. What about source compatibility? Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Is it okay? Is it okay? Set is a collection. Well, the problem is between here oh, and here. That's the override. Yeah. It doesn't work. If you would put away the override, it would work perfectly. Yeah. Is that is that an override? No, it wouldn't. No. Yeah. Yeah. If you take the override out, it would work. Uh, public class. Well, if you don't do the override, then it wouldn't get a. It wouldn't be overwritten anymore. Okay. You, can, you can override methods by changing the return type. I'm not quite sure whether that is known. You can change the return type, but you can only specialize this. Z is a feature called covariant return types. I'm not quite sure whether you ever came across this. It does weird things on the bytecode level, and I will come back to this. But here, we are overriding, no matter whether we have the whether we have the annotation or not. The annotation just helps us to manage this. Mm -hmm. But you're overriding anyway, and we are generalizing the return type. And that's not source compatible. The compiler rejects this. Yes. But you could go from collection mm -hmm. to, to something special here. Yes. To a, is that what actually work? It's called covariant return types. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. So interestingly, in bytecode, what happens is you get two methods in bytecode which have the same parameters but different return types. So there's an artificial so-called bridge method generated for you by the compiler, which is really weird. Yeah? So if you do start doing reflection, strange things happen, but I don't have an example for this. I can only explain it uh, now. Okay, so generalizing parameter types. In a way, if you think about specializing return types as strengthening <coughs> post conditions, so as guaranteeing more, it should be okay. You can think about generalizing parameter types as weakening preconditions of expecting less. So and you think that's also compatible, and from the compiler's point of view, it actually is. So Z compiles, right? But it's not binary compatible. So Z compiles because we call it with a list. So the list 
is a subtype of list, but it's also a subtype of collection. Okay? So the weakenings are preconditions, and it's still compatible from the compiler's point of view. From the linker's point of view, it isn't. Because we change the method here. Z changes the descriptor, and Z breaks it, and we get a no such method error at runtime when we try to, run, when we try to link this. Right? That's really strange. Uh, for the next example, that's really a compiler question. So I couldn't get it on one slide. So you have to memorize this, unfortunately. <laughs> Try to. Okay, so we have a class one that implements two interfaces. That's really the point. And overloading, I mean, overloading is evil anyway, so and I almost discourage this, but we have some overloading here. So we have a do it method for class one and for interface two. Mm -hmm. So for this and this. And now we generalize this method, class one, to interface one. So what happens when we try to compile this? When you compile this against this? It breaks binary compatibility as before, but what about source compatibility? It's interesting little. Yeah, what, what do you think? I would guess the compiler says you have to cast the full do it in order so he knows which one to take. Right. Sure. So it's ambiguity. The compiler has to resolve this. And uh, uh, I think what the specification is, you have to find a method with the most specific signature. I think it's something like this. I don't know, I forgot the exact phrase, what the, the language specification says. But in a way, we have a method here, we have a method here, and we try to call it with this class. Which method should we use? Mm -hmm. This one or this one? Mm -hmm. So the compiler can work it out, and the compiler actually fails with an error here. Yeah? It's a rare case, but it's an interesting case. It's a case that actually happens in practice. Yeah? So that's not really about binary compatibility. Okay, so that is a, a slightly different question here. Uh, and you can easily see that binary compatibility breaks. But it's actually source compatible. But what do you think happens to the output here? So you just print the result of this method invocation. So in a way, what you do is you take an int parameter and you widen it to a float. So that is source compatible. You can do this. It's not binary compatible, you have to recompile it. But the question is really, can we, without using reflection, by just changing a parameter in a source compatible way, can we actually change the meaning of the program, what the program does? We didn't even touch the program body. Can you see it? That's the point. We didn't touch it. And of course, you can say, well, whenever we change the signature, we just use reflection in here, and then the behavior changes. But we don't do this. We don't use reflection in here. But I think it changed the result. Yeah. Uh, so surprisingly, the result changes. And actually, I got the inspiration for this, and it's kind of a variation of one of the classic puzzlers from Joshua Bloch's book, Java Puzzlers, which I highly recommend to read. That really inspires us to some extent, as you, as you can see. Yeah? And I don't even know how it changes. It either changes from true to false or from false to true, because I don't really do this usually asking whether the maximum integer is even more odd. But with the widening operation, you're using, using precision. And that comes through if you do this operation here. I think I have it on the slide how it changes. It changes from true to false. Yeah? But it's source compatible, but the act of recompiling it actually changes the meaning of the program without you having to use reflection. So that is something uh, mm -hmm. to, be, to be aware of. So that is slightly different. Let me have a look at this. So we have uh, a static method full and we make it non-static and we call it like this. We call it as a static method. Can we do it? Let's just think about source compatibility. Uh, yeah, the compiler. compiler tells you something. You have to call static methods from the static context. Mm -hmm. Which means, uh, um, sorry, which way does it go again? Yeah, so that has to be static, but here we need an instance. So, but what about we do it the other way around? So we change a non-static method to a static one, and we call it as a non-static method. Can we do this? Yes. Source or binary? Source. What about binary? <laughs> okay. Source, I agree, you can do this. Many, I'm not even sure whether it's the Java compiler or whether it's IDEs, create a warning. IDE. Yeah, it's IDEs, yeah. They create a warning, you shouldn't really call uh, static methods like this, you should really use the class. That, mm -hmm. that makes sense, yeah? But it's binary incompatible. And the reason is that in bytecode, if you reference a method like this, you get a bytecode instruction 
for the method invocation, and there are different instructions. And for non-static methods, you get invoke virtual, invoke special for this is for constructors, and for static ones you have invoke static. And in bytecode that really changes now, and the linker looks into if you use invoke static, the linker checks, is it actually really a static method? And that happens with methods, so you can, for this reason, you lose binary compatibility if you go from static to non-static or vice versa, and the same happens to fields. Uh, I have the instruction somewhere here, so you get a so-called incompatible class change error, and for fields, the matching bytecode instructions are get field put fields, that is for reading and, and, and writing non-static fields, and get static put static for reading and writing static fields. So whenever you touch anything and make it static or non-static, you lose binary compatibility. Yeah? And again, that becomes an issue if you just build libraries and people use those libraries without recompiling. Then that suddenly becomes an issue. Yeah? Because you give some errors. Mm -hmm. Prototype versus wrapper types. Uh, source compatibility is a feature in Java. When did it come in? Oh. Oh. Five, Five called boxing, mm -hmm. unboxing, auto boxing, auto unboxing. But what about binary compatibility? You've kind of grown all generally skeptic about this by now. <laughs> yeah. So if you change magic to a new integer, does it break binary compatibility? Yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. So it's really different than bytecode, and there's no adapter that the linker uses, which is the equivalent of boxing and unboxing. So it breaks binary compatibility, and you get no such field error, and it also happens if it goes other way around. So in both cases, we break binary compatibility. So, our favorite, <laughs> generics. So, uh, we have a list of strings here, right, and we add 42, and now we change this to a list of integers, and we also add 42, but this time as a number. And then you print out the list of this. Is it, first of all, is it source compatible? Can you compile this against this? No, I think so. Yeah. Almost certainly not. Yeah? yeah? Is it binary compatible? Yes. yes. You all know this. <laughs> but what does it actually do at runtime? Like erasure. Yeah, yeah, so what does it print? Does it print something? OK, yeah. It runs, and it prints 1, which is the size of the list in both cases. Right? But what about this now? It's almost the same code. I've just now iterated over this. Exception. It's a runtime yeah. exception, yeah? But the, yeah, you're right, it's a class cast exception. Yeah, oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, should it be this, or would you like this to be a case of binary incompatibility? It, doesn't it know in bytecode what, what the return type is? Because it has to know if you're doing Reflection, Java yeah. C against it. You, it Java it, C it is, yeah, it is in the signatures of the method, not in the descriptors, but in the signatures. So you could argue that you could reason about this, but it happens that you don't. Right. Yeah? Uh, in dot .NET, that actually uh, is called by the linker, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah? So we did some similar experiments in .NET. So, okay, here's another one on generics. So you get a runtime exception. So you want this to be called by static analysis, but it's not. Yeah, it, it, it uh, results in runtime problems that blows up later. So, what about what about this one? That's more complicated. I have to give you some minutes. So the first question is really, can you actually compile this in the first place? So you have intersection types on this uh, bounded type parameter, and here you only implement serializable but not comparable. So does it compile in the first place? Do you miss an extent, so why should not compile? Well, because it requires something that is serializable and comparable. That is an intersection between those interfaces. That's really ah, what it says. Yeah, okay. and that doesn't do comparable. Does it actually matter? I, I think that is a really evil this example. It actually compiles because what it actually interprets. Uh, T is bound to serializable, to the leftmost type. So you have many of them, it's just the ratio is on the first type, 
if you have class and interfaces mixed, the class has to be the first one. And the rules are all spelled out in the language specification. But it's the first one that is used. So think about this as being integrated as serial disabled and only when you need it here. When you need comparable, then it's cast to comparable. Mm -hmm. So you can compile it, but if you run it, you run immediately into a class cast exception again. Yeah? Which you don't quite understand because you don't have a cast in here. Yeah? What happens now if you change the order? So it doesn't compile this thing? Then it blows up straight away. Yeah? Because it tries to integrate this as comparable. Yeah? That, that's really bizarre, you know, what's going on in this generic API. Yeah? Okay. That's, that's probably one of the most bizarre examples, indeed. Uh, constants. Let's quickly talk about constants. So public static oh, yeah. final int. <laughs> the question is here, if we do this, we print out 42. What about we change it to 43? What does it print out if we compile it against this library and run it with this library? 42. 42. Yeah, the course inlining, inlining oh, yeah? Two. Widely known. Do we also inline strings? Yes. Okay. Yes? No. Yes, no. we do inline strings? No. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and it says some the specifications, not just the implementation. Yeah? What about expressions? Can the compiler evaluate expressions? Or is the fact that you're not using a literal about an expression here is it enough to make it dynamic? So it's like final no, no, it's it's say it's for 42? It's still a constant. It, it, it's still for two, so the compiler is actually pretty smart. The compiler evaluates those expressions, simplifies them, and inlines them. That's right, yeah? What about uh, integers? So strings are inline, strings are not mutable. Keep in mind, integer, integers are non-mutable, immutable, sorry, immutable. So you instantiate them once, and then you can't change them anymore. Are they inline? That's for point 42 mm. or 43. I wouldn't say so. But yeah. in line, because in line is only for primitive and strings as far as I know. Why, but why strings and why not integers? I mean, they seem to be... It's just a matter of language specification. I could do it as well for the integer as well, but it didn't do. You're right. It's not in line. Yeah. <laughs> so, if a, and, and that's maybe practical advice. If you want to deal with ints, with constants, but you don't want them to be in line, mm. use integers instead. Advice for the language specification, for the language designers would be, why not have an annotation where you can actually specify whether you want it inline or not? That would probably be better. I've seen some evidence in libraries, we did some empirical studies on how this kind of stuff now works out in libraries, that seem to indicate that some people know about this really on purpose, use integer. Can't you just use a static initialization block to initialize it to a static final and there won't be a constant? If I have a static initializer block, don't assign it the normal. That might also work. I haven't tried this here. Because then I still have the primitive type, not the yeah. object overhead. And I'm not quite sure whether a static initializing block can still change those values. So in it can. Yeah. If you put a static initializer yeah. and don't assign a value to init oh, right, static yeah. initializer. Yeah. Yeah. So that might work so. Yeah. Okay. Exceptions? Um, close to that, <laughs> of this part at least. So here's one exception scenario. So we introduce an exception, right? Introduce a new exception. So the first question is, is it source compatible? No, yeah? You can compile because you don't catch it here, or you don't throw, re throw it, or you don't catch it. Is it binary compatible? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's binary compatible, yeah? But I think that is the case of something that shouldn't be binary compatible. That's something you want to link or to reason about and to catch, you know? So stuff is all the unbyte code, so why don't you reason about this, yeah? What so happens if you execute it and the exception is raised? Oh, then the exception blows up. It's not called, so it's kind of propagated to the so bottom of the like step, but it behaves like a one-time exception, yeah? yeah? So what about we generalize this now? Uh, sorry, now we remove an exception. Sorry, I skipped a couple of examples here. So we throw an I.O. exception here and we just take it out. Is it source compatible? It's not source compatible. No. Why not? Because they expect it to, to, throw, to cast up to the loop. It's expected the method to throw an exception and it's not running. Right, so you cannot reach this block. Yeah? That's right, it's not source compatible, but binary compatible, as before. Yeah? So what about, same example, but we generalize I.O. exception to exception now. 
Hold on. We have a more general exception, so is it still the same? You could get a, a runtime exception or something. Because you catch runtime exceptions, yeah? Suddenly the code is reachable, yeah? Interestingly, if you have found it a year ago, you would have found an error in the Java language specification. <laughs> which is reported and accepted now. Yeah, so language specification didn't really take this case into, into account. It was a side effect, really. Uh, two more to go. Ghost. We have an outer class foo, an inner class bar, and here method foo. And here we package foo into the package name. It's a bizarre example, indeed. Yeah? <laughs> but that's probably nothing that has a lot of relevance. <laughs> is, it, is it source compatible? <laughs> is this source compatible? Yeah. Yeah? Perfectly fine. Is it byte? Uh, binary compatible? No. Yeah? It's not, because binary, those things are really distinguished. Somebody at Swinburne, a colleague, told me today that you can actually use the dollar as a character in top level class names. I didn't actually know this, but I can almost certainly create a couple of nice scenarios out of this knowledge. So if you if you ever dreamed about implementing something like jQuery for Java, go ahead, the dollars are valid identifier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the last one. It's called bridge, and now I'm using the reflection and the client code. So the question is, what this is really doing, it's counting the methods in the outer class. And the change is, I have a private field here, and it's not private here. Can this affect the method count in the outer class? I mean, just the way, I, because I'm asking this question probably indicates it can, but how? How many me methods in the outer class do you have in here? <laughs> can, can somebody see it? One. It's a tricky one. We have one here, yeah, and here. In the outer class, how many methods do we have in the outer class? Okay, what is the method here in the outer class? Can somebody see this? And that is compiler magic, and you probably know Maybe it. Maybe it's a synthetic method, so the inner class can access the outer one? Yeah. Private is actually really enforced yeah. by the linker. And to get around this, the linker creates a getter method, and this one calls the getter, and the, and the visibility of the getter is default or protected. I think it's default, right? So you're actually calling a getter, and that's something that might show up on your stack traces sometimes, that you have funny method names which are marked as synthetic, yeah? And now, you change, you take the private away, and suddenly that's not necessary anymore. So if you recompile it, the method goes away, and the behavior changes, yeah? So, uh, in a way, the lesson learned is that binary and source compatibility don't overlap, and sometimes things you want to be caught by the linker, you want to be cases of binary incompatibility, actually you just change the behavior. But you're not caught by the linker, so it blows up later at, at runtime of your of your program. And I can quickly go back how I'm, I'm doing time wise, I'm still good. Yeah. So maybe ten more minutes or so? Fifteen. So, Fifteen? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that was my philosophical take on the, on the situation, okay? So what, what I think is a big feature, and that's controversial, not everybody might agree to this in particular lot if you work for Oracle. So, uh, so ensuring binary backwards compatibility is a major objective for the, for the JDK, for the Java evolution. And that makes sense, because they don't really want to roll out a new version of Java and tell all their enterprise clients, please recompile or restart or do something like this. You know, it should go easy and smooth. So bytecode is kept stable, and JVM innovation focuses on maintainability, stability, and scalability. As we all know, as JVM is really good, and also stuff like monitoring, you know, you know tools like like Visual VM and this kind of thing. So language evolution, however, focuses on programmer productivity, and is driven by the competition. You know, people see Scalar and 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 Groovy and Ruby and what have you, and say that is what we want in the language. So that drives Java evolution. That's also necessary. Because otherwise, the Java community loses the developers. They go for something else that is cooler and more sexy. So that creates this situation. And the, and the differences and also the little examples really show just the cracks here how, how much those things go in different directions now. 
that you have stable bytecode and stable binary compatibility and you don't really touch this kind of stuff and then you have the uh, source code going in a completely different direction and you try to bridge this gap by uh, compiler magic, right? For instance, generic types, erase, you try not to touch the bytecode, try to keep it unchanged. Inner classes, synthetic methods to bypass encapsulation, covariant return types, return type overloading, revenge versus value types, auto unboxing. So it's really compiler magic if you want. And that makes a lot of sense, but it also creates this widening gap set. And, and my point here is that creates grief and problems in reality. So how many problems? <laughs> uh, you know, there was an advertisement by Claude Van Damme yeah. for Wolfo, yeah, very famous at that. Uh, we, did a, we did a study, and because I'm an academic, I have to write papers for a living and publish them, right? So uh, there's a guy at the University of Auckland who collects Java programs and puts them into a certain structure with historic versions that's called the Qualitas Corpus. And you can do nice empirical studies to find out how programs look in the wild. And things you all know, like Maven and Tomcat, Log4j, and all those packages are all in this corpus. So what we did is, we looked for all those versions and really just looked at the JSON and you know, you have Tomcat, I don't know what's the reason for Tomcat 74, and then we have Tomcat 75. And then we diffed them and looked for whether there are incompatible ADI changes that required recompilation or at least relinking. And then we found that 75% of those upgrades actually have problems. So the people at Sun are really switched on about binary compatibility and really try to roll out binary compatible changes. Everybody else is not. So that is, uh, maybe IBM is, I don't quite know. Yeah? But at least in the open source community, there are a lot of incompatibilities. So, uh, commodity libraries, Angular, and Hibernate, Weka, uh, Cole, Jay, and Young are all heavily affected. Many constants are inlined, inlined uh, and then changed. Uh, but there are a lot of potential and only a few actual problems in a, in a sense that in the corpus we also looked for programs that use other programs in the corpus and would be affected by those changes. So often it's parts of the APIs that change that are not really used, even though they are public. Okay. Being public and being used is a different thing. Some examples. Uh, well, the bytecode analyzer we use is different from what you use, it's ASM, that's I think from French Telecom, something out of France, which is quite nice, it's very, very popular. And uh, the top class you have to implement is a class visitor to visit your bytecode tree, and that suddenly changed from an interface to a class for some reason, and that, of course, broke compatibility. So that's kind of nice if you do this kind of study, you have to eat your own dog food because you experience this as you go. Uh, that is a Apache library for access of, op, uh, of Microsoft Office document formats, right? And they have changed a method put by really using this kind of generalized parameter type <coughs> approach, so it's safely to recompile against this, but it's binary incompatible. So if you deploy this as a bundle upgrade in OSGI, it will break. If you recompile with Maven or end, it will work. So that's really the difference showing up between those two ways of, of working with your code. Uh, that's another open source package I've actually forgotten at the moment what exactly this does. But that was a case where a get items method was actually specialized from collection to that's the same story you have to recompile to make this work. But that is in a way that because you want to do things on some nice as you want to signal uh, to developers, well, what I return is actually Z in the sense it doesn't have duplicates, for instance. So that might be meaningful, yeah? But Z already causes incompatibility and potential errors if other people use this as a library. Uh, there's uh, a craft library in the corpus that had some problems with inlining. And uh, that was an interesting example here because what they really did is they used this static final field for the version number which is just a string. And then you had another package that actually used this information from the library and displayed it in a GUI. So had they just changed the library, they would have displayed the wrong version. You know? And of course, that's a no-no anyway. Your no version belongs into metadata. It become, belongs into the manifest of your library, not, not really in its code. But nevertheless, it's done all the time. You find a lot of this. So the next question we had was, what do developers know? So the so idea was, also after we came up with the set of puzzles, why don't we turn it into a survey and find out? And that is where uh, Con, for instance, helped us. Where's Con? <laughs> Big thanks, yeah. Because that is how academics usually do surveys. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that we didn't really want to do this. So we recruited uh, uh, developers from, sorry, that's Jack, of course, 
uh, or I realize now you're not actually a Java user group, you're a JVM user group. Uh, the editors of Java World were very supportive, so they blocked on Java World, and they said it's several New uh, Zealand uh, industry partners and Czech and uh, German contacts that helped us. Uh, thanks to all those people uh, who helped us. Uh, so we hosted on SurveyMonkey, we had uh, more or less a puzzle question to ask when we turned this into survey questions, so a lot of background asking questions and so on and so forth. We had uh, those questions, I don't have to go through them, that's more or less those puzzles with the three boxes. Yeah, that's really just what it is. And those are the inlining puzzlers. Uh, then we had over 400 people responding. And not all of them progressed to answer real questions, unfortunately, but we had for each question at least 49 answers and uh, for some of them up to 300, so we had a good set of answers to make some statements. So metadata, level of experience with Java, so expert, knowledgeable, not answered, so most people were having good level of experience. Uh, level of experience, four to 10 years, more than 10 years, that is not answered. And since between one and three years, so people really had experience with Java answers. This is most of them a lot, which is really uh, important. Uh, occupation here, we wanted to make sure that we don't have too many students because that kind of is not what we wanted to, to demonstrate. But we had a few, and most of the people were really programmers. So those are the ones who didn't answer this question. Results. Those are the questions on binary compatibility. If you compiled against the first version of the library, can you run it with the second version? Uh, those are the questions. Red are the wrong answers, green are the correct answer. You see how it trails off as people kind of dropped out of the survey, as it took a lot of time. As we realized how many people dropped out, we created very, very quickly a, a subset, a short version of the survey with less questions. That is why we have those peaks. The peaks are on the questions that were in the full and then the short survey. Right? But you can see here is that a lot of people didn't answer it correctly. And I don't blame them. A few months earlier, I would have got most of them wrong myself, almost definitely. Yeah. So uh, only 51% of the answers were correct, only 27 correct for simple examples like specializing return types, and only 39% correct for the for the uh, boxing examples for switching in to the repo type and and vice versa. People are much more knowledgeable and have much better understanding about the compiler. So it's a recompilation question with the one example, and it's the one with overloading. Okay, so those ambiguous type references you have to resolve here. So uh, people don't, didn't do very well in this. So otherwise, 76% correct. Inlining, it's just four questions on inlining. Uh, only half the so people understand that integers are inlined. Few less understand that uh, strings are inlined as well, and that's expression inlining. A lot of people seem to understand that integers are not inline, but I think that's kind of a double negation. They didn't understand inlining in the first place and accidentally answered this correctly. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say, but I think that really explains the sense of, it's kind of a safe assumption to say that this should be something done here. Uh, correct answers go up as people have more experience as you would expect, but it doesn't really reach a very high level. Yeah, so that's really can summarize this. Gurus don't do as well as experts, but that's of course self-assessed. You know, so we ask people, do you think you are a guru? Do you think you're an expert? We couldn't really measure this, and people uh, overestimate, I suppose, their abilities. I had a particular group of people in mind when I asked, because you're a guru, I said, yes, I, I consider them as gurus, but I'm not sure they're also modest people, <laughs> but they would have answered. So I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, we have a problem, I like those demotivational posters. That's actually a Russian website, so is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's only five more minutes now, close to the end. Uh, well, how big is the problem? So being academics, again, that's, that's an interesting, that's a valid research question, and we did some studies. Uh, and we, we tried to do one more thing, and that was uh, an interesting idea that only took five or 10 minutes to execute. We thought, what happens in issue tracking systems? do people really have to cope with those problems on a daily basis? So now you have sites like GitHub, Google Code, and, and, and Bitbucket, and most of them have public issue tracking systems. And you can actually query them, at least in a very coarse way. You have to think about false positives, false negatives. But you can just use Google with structured queries, right? So what we did there is 
if you have, it's, it's almost too simple to be academic. That's, that's the message here. We thought, well, what about we use the fully qualified class name of linkage errors. If you have no such method error, uh, or more precisely, a java.lang.no such method error, what about we query the issue tracking system for this? It's unlikely that somebody by accident puts this in a comment for something that's unrelated to this, because what people do is they copy and paste stack traces, right? And then ask questions, and you also do on stack overflow, and then you get certain numbers. But what do those numbers actually mean? How do you interpret them? If you have 1,000 occurrences of no such method error on GitHub, well, you can baseline it by asking how many stack overflows do we have there? How many class cast exceptions? So that gives you some sort of baseline you can compare it with. And you might have some, you know, that's a little bit coarse, I, uh, but it gives you some indication of how many of those problems people have in practice. And if we did this, we use this for baselining. I mean, most people decree those are common exceptions, right? That is stuff people encounter in their daily work. Uh, then we found this. So those are types of linkage errors that occur when you break binary compatibility. And I would say here, we, the majority of errors in GitHub are still, are still null pointers, as you would expect. But you have about 2,000 class cast occurrences we found. And we have 1,700 very close to this, no such method errors. So that, to me, indicates that there are a lot of problems out there with linkage-related problems. But there's no class that found error also if people forget to put the library in the class path? I would and no such class? Uh, and then the second to the last, no class that found error. Isn't this one, you mm. forget to put the jar into the class path? No, then you get a uh, class not found exception. Actually. Yeah? Uh, uh, and that might well be the case, but that would not really cover this, sure, yeah, this, this and this. Yeah? Almost definitely not. That is actually something that occurs when you compile it with a newer compiler and then try to link it with mm -hmm. an older version of the JVM. I think then you get this. Yeah? So the uh, puzzlers we discussed cause mainly this, this, and this. Okay. So problems related to binary compatibility are surprisingly common. And no such method errors are seem to be more common than stack overflows out of memory errors, which is an interesting insight, which we didn't expect at all. Yeah. But so roadmap engineering solutions. Well, what would we do about this? I think uh, one way to think about this is that uh, what does it really mean to have com compatible components, and how we de how do we deal with this in practice at the moment? A lot of those things are supposed to happen with versioning that you have uh, version text that comprise, or that have different components, a major version, a minor version, and a micro version, and that the way a version changes to the next tells you something about the compatibility. And you change the major version, you almost certainly break compatibility. If you change only the micro version, you are not supposed to break compatibility. Some communities came up with specifications that more or less say this, Particular OSGI has this, so OSGI community has rules like this, .NET has something like this, and recently I came across this, that is an uh, initiative by one of the founders of GitHub, which kind of has this kind of uh, platform technology independent rules on versioning. So what we really need now is we need tools that can actually enforce us, where we have two library versions that can tell us but if you do the version incorrectly, or do we have incompatibilities, that should actually mean that we should change the major part of the version instead of just doing the minor or the micro, right? Or even better, that you have two libraries, the newer one is on version, the older one has a version, and then we have a tool that computes the version number for us. I think that would take away a lot of those problems, because then you can use uh, Maven or OSGI, so those tools who do this reasoning about version ranges, where I say, I want a, a package or library of version between 1.0 and 2.0, and then you have somebody else who says, I provide this for your version 1.5, and then you know 1.5 is between 1.00 and 2.00, and therefore it works. But as long as we manually assign those versions, it's not going to work. So we need better tools. The only, oh, there are a couple of tools, but the most popular one seems to be Clear. Clear only checks for binary compatibility. In those cases, uh, 
very things that should be binary compatibility, but turns out to be behavioral compatibility, changing exceptions, for instance. All this is not covered by Fila. So almost certainly one can do that. Maybe in the future we even need smarter JVMs that do some subtype reasoning when they link. Yeah, by saying that could actually be compatible. Why do I have to throw an error? Can I just create an adapter on the fly, maybe with something you suggested? And academics have actually done this, creating those adapters on the fly using ECL or library suplexes. So there's some research into this. Uh, so, yeah, well, what, what you're working on, the ports of puzzles to .NET, fundamentally have the same problems here. So fundamentally, you have this kind of mismatch between the language and the virtual machine, and there's probably no way around this. You probably always have this. But now, my point is, maybe it has become too big, and we should do something about this in Java, right? Uh, build better semantic versioning tools, and uh, well, do more studies, and maybe even build a smarter JVM, which is actually not so difficult, because there are Java-based implementations of research JVM. Oracle has one, IBM has one, called Jikes. So you can actually play around and build your own JVM in Java, if you, if you wanted to. And that's that. <laughs> Sorry, I probably took too much time here. Second, so, questions. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, success of uh, integrating new version of library in uh, large application? Because I think it's not real. Yeah? Integrating yeah. multiple versions of a library? Yeah. Uh, OSGI OS does it. Yeah. You can do it in OSGI, and the key is to use different class loaders. Yeah? Oh, def definitely, you can do this. In OSGI, you have different bundles, yeah. uh, and each bundle has its own class pass, and you separate them. You can definitely do this. Uh, so I think in Maven, if you use tools like Maven, that's a little bit more difficult. It's duplicating, yeah. So it's duplicating. Yeah. yeah, because yeah, because in large application, you can have yeah. uh, thousands of dependencies, yeah, and uh, right. I think it's no chance to just replace one jar with another. If you no, no, and if you if you if you work under this assumption that you have to have one global version of the of a particular library only then you almost certainly run into an old problem uh, that's DLL help, essentially. Yeah? That's what DLL help was all about. And, and the best approach I know to work around this is really OSGI, which is based on class loaders. You have different bundles, and they completely separate this. And then you can do this, yeah? which comes at a price. You have my little versions and increased memory consumption and so on and so forth. I do believe Eclipse actually does it. It's always GI based. But if you dig deep in Eclipse plugins, you'll probably find that there are multiple, multiple versions of XML parsers around, depending almost certainly here. Do you have an engagement with the people who are sort of tech leads and commissions and people on these major? I try to get they this. Should, they should care, right? Do they care? I try to get this message across now a little bit, and to some extent that's part of I'm here, lobbying a little bit and making some aware of this. At some conversation with Alex Buckley, he's uh, the editor of the language specification, and he pointed me to some other people, and if you look around, there are a couple of people, including Alex Buckley, uh, Jim De Rieberes from IBM, who are well aware of this and gave a couple of talks at Java once about this. Not exactly the puzzle, not exactly with this kind of philosophical interpretation I did, but uh, along the same lines. So that is work you find, and I think more has to be done, uh, starting with educating developers on that those, <coughs> that those things can actually really happen. Yeah? And are difficult to debug, difficult to find out. The more libraries you have, and the deeper dependencies become, it's the yeah. more difficult it becomes. You know? Libraries that need other libraries, mm. and then those libraries can say, well, I can only work with that library if it's version 2.6.8, right. because... And I don't know Maven very well, but my, uh, what I understand about Maven and how it works is, is that you have a very strange situation, that you resolve your projects and you pull the libraries you compile against, right? So that is source compatibility. But those libraries then have dependencies to other libraries, and that's then binary compatibility. So I think if you run a Maven build, you actually mix those, depending how deep in your dependency paths your library actually sits. And it turns out that, that there's no obvious relationship between those two. Yeah. That neither binary implies source compatibility nor vice versa. So that's a particular evil situation in a way. Yeah. So that's 
participants to get the system good um, CI process uh, of like building building client testing. <coughs> I guess so. And if you had better tools like like Clear, maybe a better version of Clear, you could integrate this. That is the idea. Is that tools like this actually should be integrated into this, and then should also be used to infer uh, version numbers. And another tool that just comes to mind is uh, Peter Kreese from OSGI has written something called it's called PND tools. But Peter Kreese has in the OSGI community there is a tool that does some of the stuff as well. Uh, otherwise, have a look at Clear. Clear is kind of outdated and not maintained for a couple of years, but it still does a reasonable good job, at least in older versions of bytecode. Yeah. But um, something like Clear would be useful for your... Uh, so I think potentially a lot of, a lot of people in this room are like application developers as opposed to library developers. Right. So they would run into this problem when a library developer has, has released a version that is binary incompatible with one of their dependencies and then we're trying to use them. So would it be right that clear would be something that the, the library developer could use to detect when they're about to release something that would break their users as opposed to something that's particularly useful for us to potentially I think I think compatibility is really between a between a provider and a consumer, right? And I think uh, I think you would have to use it on both ends. I mean, from the, from the consumer's point of view, you're interested in horizontal compatibility, whether you're compatible with the library you're using. Yeah. From the library developer's point of view, you want vertical compatibility, that everything that worked with this version will keep on working with the next version. So that is maybe the main difference, but you could use the same kind of tools for both. Yeah. There could also be a problem if you're trying to write some sort of module application Right, but again, that is what OSGI is doing, you know. Right. And part of the pain can be taken away if you just separate things by class levels. So that then you and have that's what potentially have massive implication for your libraries, right? If you have some core library and that has its own dependencies, then yeah. you potentially have a copy of each one of those libraries in every module that you've got. Well, uh, y y yes and no. I'm not quite sure how much do people know about OSGI. Is it widely known or used? No, yeah. it's not. So, so more or less, the idea is. Uh, in, in OSGI, you have bundles, right? And it really depends how you use OSGI, but what you do is, is you provide something, uh, and you say, I provide a package through version 3.0. And then you have another bundle that also exports through, and maybe version 2.5. And then if you need a package, then you say, okay, I need to <coughs> some version between 2.4 and 2.6. And then the OSGI container dynamically wires those things together. And says, okay, I look for somebody who provides this in the right version range and I wire those together. And so you can actually have bundles that do nothing else than providing those commodities. Yeah? And that takes away some of this, how it's managed and what's the right level of granularity. It doesn't really answer all of those questions. It's all up to you as developers how you organize this. But that can be used to address this. That contract between those two components that they will work together is all boiled down to the fact that you say 2.5 is in 2.4 to 2.6. So you really have to rely on this. And that comes again down to how meaningful is your versioning. Do you just randomly assign it? Or do you have a marketing guy who comes, looks over your shoulder and says, we should really advance to the next major version to beat the competition? <laughs> then it suddenly all falls apart and becomes meaningless. <laughs> yeah? But if you, if you have meaning in here and have tools that compute this instead of manually assign this, mm -hmm. then you can tackle a lot of those problems, I believe. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is where things have to go. Meaningful uh, semantic versioning as, as kind of contracts between components. Is, is that version checking you're referring to in OSGI, or is that something like Maven? Uh, well, Maven does something like this as well. Yeah. How sophisticated is it to check major and minor and perhaps version numbers, or is it? No, it's not sophisticated at all. It just says that something is in a version range. So it's between here and here, inclusive or exclusive. I think you can define both. Some. In OSGI at least, I'm not sure if in Maven. Yeah, it's not sophisticated at all. So it greatly simplifies a lot of things, but that's maybe the best we can do. I so, I mean, the, the, the thing about this is that that's very common in, in Ruby, for example. Yeah. You can do this at the, at, at 
fine at resolution time without post GI in the Java, but um, generally the community doesn't do it. They tend to yeah. they tend to spine to very specific versions because otherwise things change under your feet when you when you re resolve. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a chicken egg problem there. It'd be better if it did it this way and then um, and then allowed you to lock. It says, well, once you've resolved it this way once, resolve it this way again until I tell you not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole discussion. Look at Unix, how people deal with package manager and package upgrades. You know, some people say the safest way is just get something working and then freeze it and, and don't touch it for the next six months and then, then you create the next version which you manually test and then you freeze it still again. But of course, the trade off is you run into security problems potentially if you yeah. do this. Uh, I, I don't have all of those answers, you know, <laughs> just kind of see some sorts, you know, what we could do. There are much more complicated ways of expressing this. And there's a lot of academic research in this area, but nothing is even close to come to something developers would find actually usable or uh, uh, yeah, acceptable.